Over 55 years ago, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act of 1965 into law. The landmark legislation which was passed directly due to efforts at the 1965 Selma voting rights demonstrations overturned discriminatory policies that disenfranchised black voters since the end of the Civil War. After the Voting Rights Act was passed, black voter registration increased drastically. But today, the legacy of the Voting Rights Act and the Selma demonstrations are in danger as 34 states and counting continue to pass voter ID legislation. To fully understand the fight for voting rights, we need to step back a bit, back to the Reconstruction era after the Civil War. Uh, fought a civil war in the 1860s in large measure over uh, the rights of citizenship and to vote and freedom uh, itself for uh, African Americans in the South and others. At the conclusion of that, Congress adopted a number of uh, amendments. And the Reconstruction Amendments were the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, three amendments to the United States Constitution um, that dramatically transformed it. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery, but it also had a sleeping giant clause. So it gave the federal government a lot of power to implement emancipation. So again, concretely, the 13th Amendment ended slavery in the United States. The 14th Amendment established birthright citizenship as well as the privileges, immunities, and rights of both citizens and residents. The 15th Amendment, of course, gave black men the right to vote. And the language said, no state shall abridge the right to vote for any adult male citizen based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So together, there's a reason why legal scholars have called them a revolution, uh, almost a making of a new constitution. And at first, the Reconstruction Amendments seemed to be working. African Americans again celebrated those amendments. In fact, black people organized 15th Amendment days. These were special kind of gala parades and festivals to commemorate the passage of especially the 15th Amendment. Can you imagine today um, people partying over a constitutional amendment? Um, but black people did uh, in the 1860s and they were joyous. There was a sense of profound relief and happiness. And there was a sense that, you know, these are things that we earned. These are not things the government gave to us. These are things that we earned centuries of toil the risks we took during the war, protecting Union troops and POWs. It was seen, those amendments were seen as, as really uh, positive developments in the 1860s. For a period of time, black men in the South register and vote in the 70s and 80% turnout rate, which is an extraordinary amount. And they elect hundreds and thousands of black local officials, as well as hundreds and thousands more of white Southern allies, some of whom are from the North, who remake governments, who create public education in states that have been illegal to educate African-Americans. They create schools for African-Americans, unequally funded, but still it found difference in what's there. The literacy rates of African Americans increased dramatically. The 1867 Reconstruction Acts uh, did sort of change the, the size of the electorate. It also, through uh, the military authorities, it also lengthened the amount of time you had to vote, moving from just a single day to perhaps maybe three days. As long as the military is in charge, it's also kind of the, the spirit of it is uh, trying to get as many voters as possible, and that will quickly change. The vote of nearly one million black men helped Ulysses Grant win the 1868 presidential election. However, the progress in the Reconstruction would slowly be swept away. And then as Reconstruction wrapped up, various states uh, slowly but methodically started to go back to their older ways, both in terms of labor fairness, but also in, in terms of the right to vote. By the time we reached the 20s and 30s, much of the progress of African-American voter registration, African-American voting itself, and the election of black preferred candidates to office had been walked back almost completely. When African-American men have earned the franchise and they begin voting, voter turnout statistics, especially in the South, are just so remarkable to look at. And of course, immediately there are efforts by local Southern elites, plantation owners, business owners, people who, men of property, to stop black turnout. Southern Democrats devised a Mississippi plan to systemically disenfranchise black people in the South. The era of Reconstruction came to an end, and Jim Crow emerged. 
historians talk about the second Mississippi plan. So the second Mississippi plan is a little more sophisticated in the sense that it will use the same types of tactics that the 1960s civil rights movement has to fight and challenge, i.e. the literacy clause, the poll tax, you know, a little earlier, the grandfather clause. I mean, imagine passing a, a law that says that you can almost automatically register to vote if your grandfather was eligible to vote before the end of the Civil War. But guess what? You know, if you were enslaved, obviously your, your grandfather wasn't going to be able to vote. If you were too poor and you couldn't pay a poll tax, then you couldn't vote. And the bad thing is that the Supreme Court went along with this. You know, we think of the Supreme Court and we think of Brown v. Board of Education. We forget Dred Scott and Plessy versus Ferguson. The Supreme Court gave them the go ahead to completely violate the Reconstruction Amendments, the 14th and the 15th Amendments. And so that's why they passed many of these laws. They did it in their constitutions and they did it through these laws. If the laws were not effective enough to suppress black voters, violent methods were used. Southern trees bear strange fruit Blood on the leaves and blood at the root Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze. This kind of terror in the South had lost all form of temptation. In other words, people easily engaged in racial terrorism against Black people, you know, against Jewish people, against Italians, against Catholics. And so evil lost its quality of temptation in that sense that it was almost too easy for these types of crimes to be committed and the media and the people in power bent when these when these things happened. They wanted, it was kind of medieval, barbaric, it was a, a lesson being said to terrify an entire community and to completely stamp out Reconstruction. That was the main goal. In 1920, between 30 to 35 black people were murdered by a white mob in Osoe, Florida. The purpose of the attack? To send a message to other black people attempting to vote. They're meant to strike fear, not just to attack or injure or kill a person, but to strike fear in communities. They're what scholars call exemplary violence, violence that's meant to make an example. Decades of discrimination, murder, and injustice, African Americans were tired and wanted change. I have a dream that my poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. A turning point in the fight for civil rights came in 1965 in Selma, Alabama. Local demonstrators had long been fighting Jim Crow voter suppression policies, but after the murder of peaceful protester Jimmy Lee Jackson at the hands of an Alabama state trooper, a decision was made to march to Montgomery, Alabama. And on March 7th of 1965, all eyes were on Selma. single place. 
to shape a turning point in man's unending search for freedom. So it was at Lexington and Concord. So it was a century ago at Appomattox. So it was last week in Selma, Alabama. The impact of the Voting Rights Act was felt. However, not everyone was happy with this change. The Voter Rights Act of 1965 uh, has always been in, in danger. And the reason why it's been in danger is because you don't want to provide all the security uh, that came with the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And that's one of the reasons why you see all the challenges for you to even see the opposition when we are trying to update the Voting Rights Act to make sure people have equal access to vote without having to go through undue, uh, I would say, duress in order to make their vote count. Specifically, opponents cited Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, which required states to get federal preclearance before implementing new voter laws. So the Voting Rights Act in 1965 was passed and it had a number of innovations, but the, one of the key innovations was what we call preclearance. It essentially froze uh, election rules in states that had a history of race discrimination in voting. And anytime they changed the voting rules, they had to get approval from the United States Department of Justice, Attorney General, or from a three-judge federal court in D.C. While the Voting Rights Act's provisions would be challenged in cases such as South Carolina versus Katzenbach and Allen versus State Board of Elections, the Supreme Court ruled to strengthen preclearance in both cases. The Voting Rights Act's preclearance formula received strong bipartisan support and was renewed by two Republican presidents. We have not sacrificed and fought and toiled to protect that right so that now we can sit back and permit a barrier to come between a secret ballot and any citizen who makes a choice to cast it. The Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. It's considered one of the most important pieces of civil rights legislation ever passed. But by five to four, the U.S. Supreme Court today took the teeth out of a law enacted nearly 50 years ago. So under the landmark Voting Rights Act, changes to voting laws in these nine states required advance approval by the Justice Department, but not anymore. So now the court is saying the test you had in place is outdated. It goes back to 1965. So much has changed. Shelby County versus Holder was a direct attack and a gutting of the Voting Rights Amendment. So the Voting Rights Amendment of 1965 was a landmark case that established the right to vote and free from discrimination and made voting access equal for all and tried to prevent against all of the threats that were happening to voting, particularly in Southern states. Ultimately, I went to the US Supreme Court. I was actually in the Supreme Court chamber when it was argued. I was in the Supreme Court chamber when the, when the, uh, when, when the clerk announced Chief Justice Roberts has the opinion of the court. And there were gasps in the courtroom when that was announced because so many civil rights leaders and voting rights leaders going all the way back to MLK's time were in the courtroom that day. And all of them instantly knew in that moment that in all likelihood there would no longer be preclearance. Shelby County versus Holder declared Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act unconstitutional, making Section 5, the preclearance formula, irrelevant. Chief Justice John Roberts, longtime detractor of the Voting Rights Act, argued that the preclearance formula had already done its job, citing how African-American voter registration had increased tremendously since 1965. Congress must ensure that the legislation it passes speaks to current conditions. The coverage formula, unchanged for 40 years, plainly does not do so, and therefore we have no choice but to find that it violates the Constitution. In her dissent, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg would argue against Robert's view, stating how throwing out preclearance when it has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you are not getting wet. I love that quote. It's one of my favorite quotes and it's perfect. I mean, it exactly sums it up. I mean, you don't throw away your umbrella when it's raining because it's working. And that's exactly what preclearance did. I mean, it made it so they states weren't able to discriminate against individuals based on their color by making up bizarre types of rules and procedures and barriers they were putting in place in order to prevent people from voting. The impact of the Shelby County decision was immediate. States that were previously unable to pass voter restriction laws due to federal preclearance 
immediately started implementing voter ID laws, purged voter rolls, and restricted mail-in voting. I was in the Supreme Court chamber when Shelby County was announced. They don't let you take your phone in there. You have to you have to put it in a locker. So after the court adjourned, we walked out and the lawyers all retrieved their phones from the locker. I turned mine on and instantly the then Texas Attorney General Greg Abbott announced that voter ID law in Texas was in effect. It had been stopped under preclearance in a case that I and others tried in Washington, D.C. The court found it discriminatory and said, Texas, you cannot get preclearance. So Texas just immediately ignored that finding and implemented the law. With only 31 cases of voter impersonation since 2000, photo ID laws would have a higher likelihood of suppressing the vote of African Americans than preventing voter fraud. In spite of all of the rhetoric to the contrary, there is no proof of widespread or even significant in-person voter fraud. And that's what justifies the Voting Rights Act or anti-Voting Rights Act provisions like voter ID. Furthermore, a 2020 MIT study demonstrated that voter fraud through mail-in ballots was five times less likely than getting struck by lightning. Despite this, claims of voter fraud have been used to justify voter suppression policies. And in the 2020 election, false voter fraud claims by President Trump, media pundits, and others had devastating consequences. The Capitol riots highlighted the danger of misinformation, but also demonstrated an underlying distrust in American democracy. Claims of voter fraud in election security were used more recently to block the passage of the For the People Act losing an opportunity to strengthen the Voting Rights Act. While not replacing the For the People Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act aims to restore provisions of the original Voting Rights Act. But with major opposition in the Senate, the legacy of the Voting Rights Act continues to remain in danger.